while we are created in the image of God, God also gave us the gift of free will. And with that free will, more often than not, we choose ourselves rather than God, which then is an act of sin, turning away from God, turning more towards ourselves. And so on a whole, we are broken. We are a broken people in need of God. We just can't save ourselves. And so that's why God sent Jesus to save us. Hello, and welcome to More Than Sunday, a weekly podcast where we take a deeper dive into the stories, themes, and questions of our faith. My name is Eric Chikowski. I'm the director of Access, our modern worship community at First United Methodist Church Richardson. And with me every week is our lead pastor, Julie Richter. Julie, how's it going? Hey, man, it's pretty good. It's a little bit busy this week. This is Holy Week in the church, and so we've got services on Thursday night and Friday night, and then, of course, leading up to Easter Sunday. So it's busy, but it's good. That's awesome. Do you have any uh, big plans, uh, family coming in town, or any any get-together plans on Easter? Yeah, so in addition In addition to being a a preacher and pastor myself, I am in a family of ministers. And so all of my family will be doing all of the traditional services of Easter. So what we do on uh, Easter Sunday, um, after all is said and done and Jesus is risen, is we take a nap. How about you? Naps are so good. (laughs) Naps are so good. I so rarely get my Sunday nap because I've got some Sunday afternoon responsibilities too. And so, boy, a nap sounds really good. I think my wife's Family and uh, parents are going to be coming to town, and so we'll share a meal together. Actually, I think Saturday evening, because uh, they often have to head back to Houston after that, and then we'll get together with my parents on Sunday evening. So nice. kind of split the time a little bit, yeah. and spread the family time out, but yeah, it'll be a great weekend. So, well, we are so excited to welcome you all to this week's episode. We're going to be speaking with Reverend Jill Jackson Sears. Jill is the senior pastor at Lake Highlands United Methodist Church, and we're going to talk about the forgiveness of sins today. Julie preached on it on Sunday, and we want to just dive a little bit deeper into that conversation. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, we're in this week of the church right now called Holy Week. And so on Thursday night, we have a service called Maundy Thursday, and that word Maundy means mandate. And so it's a night where we come and we remember the last meal that Jesus had with his disciples before dying on the cross. Then we come back on what is called Good Friday, and we have a service where we remember Jesus's crucifixion, and we remember the words and the moments that led up to the cross and then ultimately Jesus's death on the cross. And yet, while it's a service about death, we call it Good Friday because there's something about what we say in our creed about the forgiveness of sins that is good for us, and that in Jesus's death, that there is a love that is on display where we can recognize fully that Jesus has forgiven us and calls us to a deeper love through that. I think a question that a lot of people have is how does the death of Jesus mean that I'm forgiven for my sins? And maybe even another question, what kind of God would sacrifice his own son so that humanity might be forgiven? And those are some really difficult questions to answer. So we're really excited to hear Jill's perspective and just a little bit about her stories and experience on this topic. We are really excited today to welcome Reverend Jill Jackson Sears to our podcast. Jill is the senior pastor at Lake Highlands United Methodist Church in Dallas and somebody that I had the pleasure of working with for just a short time and just was a wonderful experience. We are really excited to welcome you to the podcast today. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. So thank you for being bold and willing to have a conversation about something that I think is difficult for people to to articulate sometimes, a conversation around redemption and forgiveness and some of these words that are sort of core to our Christian faith, but sometimes we don't have handles to maybe talk about with. And so I wanted to maybe just start a little bit with you personally and with your story. Would you be willing to share just some ways maybe that you've experienced personally God's forgiveness or redemptive work in your own life? I'd like to tell a story of something that happened within the church that has continually spoken into my life. We have a campus that is off of our main campus 
It's called The New Room, and it ministers with people who are materially poor. And there was a woman who attended that worshiping community for seven years. Now, she's single, African-American, and living in Section 8 housing. In some ways, she's got three significant hurdles that she's living into. I mean, she's got poverty, racism, and gender inequality. So to some degree, she's trapped in all of these systemic sins. And um, she made her way to the church. And while she was there, she discovered the love of Christ, and she discovered that she's valued. And we began to see the gifts that were in her and gave her opportunities to serve in different ways with after-school tutoring and helping with hospitality. And so um, she began to see the possibilities that maybe she hadn't seen before for her life. About seven years into our relationship with her and in her growth of faith, During prayer request, one day she raised her hand and she said she had a praise that she had been saving money for several years and now would be able to live into this dream that she believed God always had for her life. And so she was now going to go to truck driving school, which doesn't sound like that big of a deal, except that she was being set free to get out of some of the systems that she was in and now be able to live out her dream of being able to drive all over the country and to make a living and to have a new life that she hadn't had before. Now, that's not to say she's not going to deal with other hurdles and and other struggles, but to see someone grow into a new life. I mean, for me, just watching her was like resurrection, because she seemed like she was in a fairly hopeless situation, which all of a sudden she was able to find hope and live in a new way she hadn't lived before. I love that understanding of redemption as breaking free from the things that bind us. And I think those things that bind us are different for all of us. But to hear a story of someone who was truly trapped in a way that most of us don't really understand. And for someone like that to find redemption, it also tells us about the community of the church, that it's not for a certain group of people who have it all together. It's also for those people who feel trapped and who feel like they can't get away from the things that bind them. And that through the church, they can also find redemption in the message of Christ. So maybe we should have started here, but maybe a little bit of definition even around the word redemption or the word redeemed. I wonder if it might be helpful for some people, again, just in our own understanding and our ability to articulate to others. Do you mind speaking a little bit about how you would define what it means to be redeemed? Our very nature, while we are created in the image of God, God also gave us the gift of free will. And with that free will... More often than not, we choose ourselves rather than God, which then is an act of sin, turning away from God, turning more towards ourselves. And so on a whole, we are broken. We are a broken people in need of God. We just can't save ourselves. And so that's why God sent Jesus to save us. Yeah, so I love that question. What does Christ save us from? So how would you answer that? Ooh, I think Jesus saves me from myself. Yeah, right. <laughs> I would say the same thing. Jesus saves us from ourselves. And yeah. that, quite frankly, might be the first step for all of us to be mindful of the fact and admitting of the fact that we need a Savior and then be able to say, okay, so what does that look like? In talking of redemption and that freedom, we're in the midst of Holy Week this week and interested about how you might articulate the connection of that redemption or that freedom to the cross. We're coming up to Good Friday in two days. And how do we make those connections as Christians? So there's a big church word that we use called atonement. I dare you to put that into a conversation sometime this week, because it's just not a word that we use very often. Um, But you can break it down into et, one, ment. Basically, looking at Jesus, and in particular what he did on the cross, and saying, how does what Jesus did bridge the gap in our relationship with God? So if sin is that gap, what does Jesus do then to heal that relationship and reconcile us with um, God? There are a variety of what are called atonement theories that help us understand what Jesus did. But I kind of hold on to a bouquet of atonement theories, which I think are a more robust understanding of really what Jesus was all about and what he did to mend that relationship. 
So one is incarnational theory, where we believe that just God's presence with us in Christ was atoning work in itself. Mm. And then you can expand upon that and say the moral exemplar theory, where Jesus's life, the way he taught, he healed, he forgave, the teachings on the kingdom of God, the way he lived was atoning work. But then you build upon that even more, and you can add what's called the canonic theory. So if you look in Philippians 2, there's a Christ hymn in there where they describe Jesus as humbling himself, but the word is kenosis, which actually means pouring out. So Jesus chose to pour his life out on the cross because he loves us. That's where I like to go. Other people maybe go more into the substitutionary atonement or a ransom theory of atonement where they say that God basically sent his son to die on a cross. And there are some people that really struggle with that because it doesn't seem like a loving God Mm. that would put his son on a cross. I choose to go more on the canonic side of things where it was Jesus's choice Mm. to pour himself out. Now, with that, I also believe that it was Jesus' choice to take on the sin and the shame and the pain of the world so that when he died on the cross and rose again, that he was victorious over sin and evil, which is called the Christus Victor theory of atonement. And so I hold on to all of these different theories of atonement because to me, it's more comprehensive. It's more holistic as to who Jesus really is. I mean, you can take one. I mean, one flower on its own is fine. But when you put them all together, I think it's a more beautiful expression of who Jesus is and what he did out of love for us. Well, and I think that those different theories also tell us a little bit about different points in history where some of those theories made a lot of sense to people about how they find access and connection to God. And especially in the early church, uh, when Christianity was seen as a section of Judaism, when Paul began to say, there is no longer slave or free, Jew or Gentile, male or female, but all are one in Christ, choosing to see Jesus as a sacrifice was also a way to say to those people who are not Jewish, you don't need to sacrifice other things anymore. You know, Jesus was a sacrifice for you. And so I tend to agree with you, Jill, that that one doesn't connect with me as much, but it has been helpful for me to understand how it connected to other people in their understanding of Christ and Christ's work in us and through us. So, Eric, you mentioned earlier that we're coming up on Good Friday. And it's a weird thing for me to say that Good Friday is one of my favorite services in the church, but it really is because I believe that death comes before resurrection. And it's one of those places where we truly are humbled and recognize our need for forgiveness. And those words from Jesus on the cross ring in my ears on Good Friday, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I tend to say that in my own head, Father, forgive us when we don't know what we're doing. What can you think of in our world or our country or personally, what do we need forgiveness for? Well, I think there are some kind of easy answers to that. We were able to see what we call systemic sin Mm -hmm. in our country. We talk about racism, gender inequality. And I think even recently with some of the school shootings, the consequences of our systemic sin are being put in our face. And we have to decide whether or not that's something that we're going to admit to and something we're going to confront. And I think it's easy for us. I'm seeing a lot of blame going on, a lot of fingers being pointed at others, where I argue that we need to take a look at ourselves individually and ask the question, how am I a part or participating in what's happening in this country as a whole? I wonder if the sin of busyness might be coming into play to some degree, and that affects many of us. Because we get so self-absorbed that those people who might be struggling with mental illness or other challenges who easily fall through the cracks, we're just not seeing them anymore because we're so much into ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I I think that's a sin that all of us have to confront individually if we want to make a greater impact in the country. Yeah, it, it makes me think of when Jesus talks about the sins of omission, not the things that we do that are sinful, but the things that we leave undone or that we don't do. And he says in the scripture, you know, where were you when I was hungry? Did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? That's always ringing in my head. What am I 
overlooking because I'm so focused on the tasks and the things that have to get done? And what am I leaving undone and not being willing to let my life have any sort of interruption or things outside of the schedule? There's a guy who um, stops by the church about once or twice a month. He's a homeless man who lives in the creek that runs to the east of the church. And he usually shows up just looking for food, but it's really hard to tell what he's looking for because he has some speech disabilities. He had some mental disabilities. He's very challenging to communicate with. But when you ask him what his name is, he says his name is God. And I think God has... Not God, who I'm talking about, but God in a more eternal sense has a great sense of humor to bring this person into my life Mm. because I absolutely have to stop. And basically, I cannot ignore the need around me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to come to my door and say, I need food. And my name is God. And my name is God. (laughs) Wow. Gosh. What a reminder. Seriously. Wow. So we talked just a few minutes ago about the importance of acknowledging our need for a Savior and our need for forgiveness. How do you think that helps us grow in our faith? I think simply knowing that God is God and I am not is a great first step. I don't know how you grow in your faith until you come to that realization. So, Joe, we have one last question for you that we ask all of our guests, and so you can answer this however you want. At this point in your life, what's the one thing you wish somebody would have told you? Hmm. Well, I'll share with you something that that someone did share with me Hmm. early on in my life that was very helpful. You can have it all, but you can't have it all at the same time. Hmm. I, I think we live in a culture that does promote that you can have it all and that you should have it all. And I think that you can, but maybe there are different seasons for all things. Mm. Keeping that perspective and realizing that we are put on this earth for something so much greater than ourselves. Those have been important guiding words for my life. Mm -hmm. What great guiding words for our faith. That it is about what God does in us, but it is about so much more than us. Okay, before you shut it down. For sure. So as we finished the interview, we all got up to leave. But Jill stopped us because she had one more thing she wanted to say. So your opening question, yeah. I dodged. Okay. Did you notice that? I did, but it's okay. Well, you could have <laughs> called me out on it. That's okay. I really would have been okay with that. Okay. Um, but I, I was thinking about it, you know, personally. And there are lots of places, lots of stories that I could tell. Mm. But I think one of the most meaningful moments in my life was early on in my marriage, uh, we really wanted children. And it just took a while for that to happen. Mm. And when it did, we were so excited. And I told my church quickly, around 10 or 11 weeks in the pregnancy, went in and found out that I was miscarrying the child. Mm. And um, that was devastating to us. It was physically, emotionally, spiritually painful. In all of that, in that experience, I remember having a vision, and I know it sounds weird, and whenever you tell people you had a vision, there's some question marks that arise, but I really do believe. I closed my eyes and was praying to God in that time and saw Jesus' arms outstretched on the cross. Mm. To me, not only was it an expression of Jesus opening his arms to me in that time of pain, but also... It was important for me to remember that Jesus knows what suffering is Mm -hmm. and that God knows what suffering is and that I wasn't in it alone and this wasn't anything that God was doing to me, but that God was with me. That moment carried me through Mm -hmm. and really transformed my faith. Out of that, I've been able to witness to that moment because it's something we just don't talk about in the church very much. And a lot of people go through miscarriages. It is the loss of a child, but we don't talk about it. And and we pretend that it's not there, but it is, and it's real and it's hard. But to know that God is with us, God knows what it's like to lose a child on a cross. There's some comfort in that, that I think we can hold on to in the difficult times. Thank you for sharing. All right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. Well, and I think it's, as you said, something that we don't talk about. And I think 
what better family to know that you're going through that than your church? Mm. What better family to be able to talk about that in? You know, so often that 12-week mark in a pregnancy is sort of that like, okay, we're safe to tell people, quote unquote, right? And yet I find that even I struggled with that to some degree because if, heaven forbid, something devastating like that happens, I want my people to know. Mm. You know, I want my church to know. I want my brothers and sisters to know so that they can rally around me and my family and my wife. And so thanks for your boldness in in sharing that. And Mm -hmm. and hopefully that's an encouragement to others that they might be willing to share those stories as well and to let others know that they're not alone going through a situation similar or other kinds of loss as well. That's why we exist as a church and as a community. Mm. Well, I think God's really used that experience as an opportunity for me to share my witness of faith and how God was with us in that moment. It was interesting. I shared it in a worship service one Sunday and the number of people who came to me thanking me for sharing that because that's a part of their lives that they've struggled with. One woman gave me a great way of thinking about the cross in the midst of all that. She said, you know, remember when Jesus died on the cross, how the temple curtains were torn in two. Mm -hmm. And so often when we think of that, we think, oh, well, that was God, you know, removing the barrier Mm -hmm. between us and God. But for her, it was God tearing his clothes in the death of his son, that Mm. suffering, that heartbreak, that wrenching of and the ripping of the curtain was another expression of God's anguish Mm. in that moment that I thought was really powerful to think about as a way of um, making sense of a difficult time. And you mentioned the reminder to you that God knew what it was like to lose a child and that Jesus in his fully human and fully divine form knew what it was like to suffer and to feel forsaken and to feel pain and to experience death. And yet our reminder is that death doesn't have the final word. Right. Right. Even in the most difficult, Mm -hmm. hopeless situations that God is able to bring new life out of that, which seems gone. Well, Jill, you have been just a wonderful person to come on this week during Holy Week. I think we've taken some really difficult topics and gotten to hear some really important stories and connect to our faith in a really important way. So thank you for coming on and for talking to us today. What a powerful story about struggle and the way in which God stays with us. And I'm reminded that what we see on the cross is a love that hangs on. There is no suffering, struggle, pain that God does not understand because of the crucifixion of Jesus. As we walk into the next few days leading up to Easter, we're reminded that This love hangs on with us. This love does not leave us. This love stays with us in the darkest and most painful moments of our lives, but tells us that we don't have to stay there. I wanna leave you with a poem by Jan Richardson today that is for the message of Good Friday. It's a poem called, What Abides. You will know this blessing by how it does not stay still, by the way it refuses to rest in one place. You will recognize it by how it takes first one form, then another. Now running down the face of the mother who watches the breaking of the child she had born. Now in the stance of the woman who followed him here and will not leave him bereft. Now it twists in anguish on the mouth of the friend whom he loved. Now it bears itself in the wound, the cry, the finishing and final breath. This blessing is not in any one of these alone. It is what binds them together. It is what dwells in the space between them, though it be torn and gaping. It is what abides in the tear the rending makes. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of More Than Sunday. We've got a new episode coming out every Wednesday, so be sure to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or on YouTube so that you don't miss our next show. If you want to find out more about the Access community here at First United Methodist Church Richardson, find us online at accessfumcr.com 
as well as on Facebook and Instagram. Special thanks to Jill Jackson Sears this week for her time, and make sure you tune in next week as we talk to the Reverend Jonathan Grace about resurrection. Have a great week, and happy Easter. Happy Easter.